Hi students, today we are going to learn about an interesting phenomena that you must have seen in your daily life. We are going to learn about electric current. Electric current is all around you, isn't it? If you look at a bulb, the bulb is being lit by electric current. If you look at a tube light, again electric current, an air conditioner, electric current, hair dryer, electric current, fan, washing machine, fridge, everything involves electric current. So what is this electric current? There's even a law called Ohm's law, which you know helps us understand electric current. We're going to study all about this in this chapter. And then you know some objects resist the flow of electric current. We are going to study about these resistors and resistor combinations in this chapter also. So let's proceed with this interesting chapter. Here we go. First of all, what is electric current? You see. In every conductor, there are some electrons called free electrons, which are free to move throughout the surface of the conductor. What this means is they are not bound in the atom. They can move anywhere in the conductor volume. Understood? So these electrons, they move randomly here, there and everywhere. However, their net motion in any direction is zero. They just move randomly. So their random motion in all the directions cancels each other. Now, when you apply a potential difference across a conductor, however, these electrons start moving in a specific direction. So for example, they move from the negative potential end to the positive potential end. This is what happens. So in a way, you can even imagine that the electrons have become an electron gas. You see, in a gas, all the molecules move randomly. But if the gas is moving in a certain direction, then along with the random motion, all the molecules are also moving in a particular specific direction. Similarly, when a potential difference is applied across a conductor, the randomly moving electrons, they continue to move randomly. But you know, the net cloud, the net mass or gas of electrons also moves in a certain direction from the negative potential end to the positive potential end. Now, the rate of net movement of charge through a conductor is what is called electric current. So the net charge flowing in a particular direction per second is called electric current. Understood? So as you can see, the number of electrons flowing from the negative potential to the positive potential in one second is electric current. So the net charge flowing per second is electric current. Interesting, isn't it? Now another interesting fact here is that you know the random velocity of electrons in general in metals is around 10 raised to 5 meters per second. This means that the electrons are moving here, there, in all directions at this speed. However, the velocity of the electron cloud, that is the velocity of the electrons in a specific direction when an electric potential or electric field is applied is around 10 raised to minus 4 meters per second. So as you can see, the random velocity is much, much more than the velocity of the electron cloud, which results in the flow of electric current. Interesting again, isn't it? But I just told you so that, you know, you could keep things in perspective and see what is happening. So did you understand what electric current is? I can be written as dq by dt, the rate of flow of charge per unit time in a specific direction because of the electric potential applied or the electric field applied. Again, I can repeat it for you. The electrons are generally moving in random directions, but when a potential is applied, they move in a specific directions. And the rate of movement of this electron gas is electric current. One interesting fact that you must remember here is that the direction of electric current is always assumed to be opposite to the direction of motion of the electrons. So if the electrons are moving from right to left, the current is assumed to be moving from left to right. So basically we assume, you know, that positive charge is moving from left to right when in reality electrons are moving from right to left. So mathematically, what is electric current? It is basically the number of coulombs of charge passing the cross-sectional area of the conductor in one second. So, you know, if you imagine that this disk here contains one coulomb of charge, then the number of such disks passing per second through the area of the conductor is called electric current. So the number of coulombs passing through the area is electric current. 
the unit of electric current is ampere. What is one ampere? It is one coulomb per second. Because if there are n coulombs of charge passing through an area in one second, then the electric current is n amperes. Now, the electric current can be expressed in terms of the speed at which the electrons move in a specific direction. For example, you know these electrons here are drifting along in a specific direction because of the electric potential or electric field applied. The net speed at which these electrons drift, you know around 10 raised to minus 4 seconds, that speed, it is called drift velocity. So drift velocity is the net speed at which electrons drift in a specific direction when an electric field or potential is applied. Drift velocity is represented by the symbol Vd. Now we can express the electric current, the net charge flowing per second in terms of this drift velocity. When we do that, we get this expression. I is nq a into Vd. Now of course, this expression sounds confusing. I mean, where did it come from? Well, let me tell you how this expression came. In this expression, n represents the net number of charged particles per unit volume. So you can say that this is, say, number of charged particles per unit volume. Q represents the charge on each charged particle. So it's the charge per particle. Understood? So NQ represents the net charge present per unit volume in the conductor. Isn't it? Now we know that electric current is basically the amount of charge flowing per second. Therefore, it is equal to the net charge per unit volume into the volume of charge flowing per second. Isn't it? That is obvious. After all, electric current is the net charge flowing per second. So that will be equal to the net charge per unit volume present throughout the conductor into the volume of charge flowing per second. Isn't it? The volume of charge flowing per second is clearly the area of cross-section of the conductor into the drift velocity. Isn't it? The volume of charge flowing per second is area into velocity. There's no doubt about it. Therefore, the net electric current can be given by this expression that you see on your screen in this blue box. And yes, you must remember this expression. As you can see, N represents the number of charged particles per unit volume. Q represents the charge on each particle. So I is NQ A into VD, where VD is the drift velocity, A is the cross-sectional area of the conductor, and NQ is the net charge per unit volume in the conductor. This expression is very useful in solving objective type questions. Now, we know that the net charge flowing through the area of cross-section of the conductor per second is electric current. Isn't it? Charge passing through an area in one second is current. The charge passing through one meter square of area in one second is given a special term called current density. So current density is the net charge flowing through one meter square of area of the conductor in one second. Current density is generally represented by the symbol J. As you can see, J is di by ds, current per unit area. Understood? So again, J is an important quantity that we generally use when we talk about electric current. What will be the value of J in terms of drift velocity? Clearly, J is NQ into VD. After all, current was NQA into VD. And J is the current per meter square, the current per area, isn't it? Therefore, J is NQ into VD without the A. Now, there is something more that we need to learn about the current density. You know, sometimes you are given to calculate the current density and you are given an area S. In that case, you simply say that J is I by S, isn't it? Current per unit area. Now the problem comes when you see that the area across which you have to calculate current density is at an angle theta with the area perpendicular to the current. Understood? Area is not perpendicular to the current. It is at an angle theta as shown in this figure. In such a case, you cannot just say, you know, that J is I by S if S is the area across which you have to calculate current density. 
in this case you will have to take the component of the area in the direction perpendicular to the electric current understood so for example s here is like this and the component of s in the direction perpendicular to the electric current is s cos theta isn't it so j will be i by s cos theta it won't be i by s always in fact when we say j is i by s we assume that cos theta is zero you know when the area is perpendicular to the direction of electric current then clearly theta is zero isn't it so this is again an important fact that you must remember that j is i by s cos theta when the area across which we have to calculate current density is an angle theta with respect to the perpendicular to the electric current then j is i by s cos theta now sometimes a weird thing happens we are given an area that is taking different different angles with the electric current you know at different places and we you know are given the current density and we are asked to calculate the electric current flowing through this area this is a special type of problem asked in objective type questions for example let's say you are asked what is the amount of current flowing through this area and you are given the current density j okay now what will you do you could have used the formula i equal to j into s isn't it you could have done this but as you know the area s that you use here must be perpendicular to the electric current now here in this case the angle made by the area keeps on varying with respect to the electric current isn't it it is some value here some value here and some value here the area here makes an angle let's say theta with this vertical the area here is perpendicular to the electric current the area here make some other angle say phi with the electric current isn't it so as you can see how can you use the formula j equal to i by s cos theta so if you are required to calculate the electric current through this area in this case you cannot even say i equal to j into s cos theta because even theta is varying so in this case you consider an elemental area here and you calculate the elemental current flowing through this area di and you say that di the elemental current is j into ds cos theta understood because for this particular element the angle theta with the vertical is constant isn't it so you can say you know that di is j ds cos theta for the elemental current and then you can integrate this current from this position to this position and you can integrate the right side like this isn't it and then you know you can express the value of ds in terms of theta so di is j ds cos theta and i is integral j ds cos theta understood now this is an important formula and you must again remember it this might seem a bit weird and confusing at first but i can repeat what we have done for you all that i did here was that you know i had to calculate the electric current when i was given the electric current density so i said i could use the formula i equal to j s cos theta but in this case as you can see theta keeps varying the angle that the area vector keeps making with the vertical keeps varying so i cannot say i is j s cos theta because what is theta so in this case we take an element ds and we calculate the current through that element di equal to j ds cos theta the advantage is that for that particular element theta is constant now we can integrate on both sides to get the final electric current passing through this entire semicircular area a bit confusing but if you ponder over it you'll definitely get it so those were the concepts related to electric current electric current density and the area across which electric current density is calculated one more interesting fact that you must remember for objective type questions is that current is not a vector quantity but current density is a vector quantity now current also has direction isn't it after all when we say that current is flowing through a wire the current is flowing in a certain direction still we do not consider current to be a vector quantity on the other hand current density is always considered to be a vector quantity
we will not go into details of exactly why current is not a vector quantity or why current density is a vector quantity as it is outside the scope of the IITJ syllabus. But for now, you definitely need to remember these facts. We can actually compare the flow of electric current to the flow of water from a tank kept at a higher level to a tank kept at a lower level. For example, current is equivalent to the mass flow rate of water in such a case. In the case of water, water molecules are flowing from a higher gravitational potential to a lower gravitational potential. In the case of electric current, electrons are flowing from one potential to the other potential. Similarly, the current density is equal to the mass flow rate of water per unit area. The drift velocity in the case of electric current is equivalent to the velocity of water as it flows from the tank at a higher height to a tank at a lower height, isn't it? So basically the flow of electric current is very similar to the flow of water. In the case of electric current, electrons are flowing and in the case of water flow, water molecules are flowing, isn't it? In the case of electric current, it's the potential difference that causes the electrons to flow and the current to flow. In the case of water, it is the height difference which causes the water to flow or the water molecules to flow. Understood? You know, if you visualize exactly how water is flowing, you will slowly start understanding electric current more. Now we've studied so many concepts related to current, current density, drift velocity and so on. Let's now have a look at an IITJ problem to clear our concepts. Here we go. This problem was asked in IITJ 1997. A steady current flows in a metallic conductor of non-uniform cross-section. The quantity or quantities constant along the length of the conductor is or are current electric field and drift speed, drift speed only, current and drift speed, current only. Basically in this question, we are given a metallic conductor that has a non-uniform area of cross section. And we are asked, you know, across this metallic conductor, will the current vary? Will the electric field vary? And will the drift speed vary? So we are given these three quantities, current, electric field and drift speed. And we are asked if they will vary. So let's take a look. So this is our metallic conductor. Now, we know that current is equivalent to the mass flow rate in case of water flow, isn't it? So instead of, you know, imagining electrons flowing through this metallic conductor, let us try to imagine that it's water flowing through this metallic conductor or water flowing through a pipe of non-uniform cross-section. In that case, the mass flow rate, will it be constant or not? The mass flow rate will clearly be constant, isn't it? That's because mass coming in from one end per second will definitely have to come out from the other end in one second, isn't it? Because the net mass is constant, isn't it? Similarly, current is basically the charge flowing per second. So the net charge coming into this conductor per second must be the same as the net charge going out of the conductor per second. Therefore, current is definitely constant, irrespective of whether the area of cross section is constant or not. So I1 represents the electric current flowing out of the conductor on the left and I2 represents the electric current coming into the conductor on the right. Now as you can see, I will be equal to NQ A into VD, isn't it? We had just studied this formula some time back. Now at the left end of the conductor and at the right end of the conductor, N will be the same, isn't it? Because N represents the number of charged particles per unit volume. And that will clearly be the same, isn't it? In the case of water flow, the density is always constant, isn't it? The amount of mass per unit volume is always constant. Similarly, the amount of charge per unit volume will also be constant in this case. So NQ will basically be constant for I1 and I2. However, the areas of cross section at the left end and the right end will be different because we are given in the question that our conductor has a non-uniform area distribution. Now we know that A is different for both cases. So the drift velocity must also be different because as you can see, I1 is equal to I2. 
therefore a1 into vd1 will be equal to a2 into vd2 so when the area is more drift velocity is less and when the drift velocity is more the area is less isn't it for example here you can see that the area of cross section is more so the drift velocity is less and the drift velocity is more here because the area of cross section is less now since our conductor has a varying area of cross section the drift velocity is definitely varying so the drift velocity is varying and the current is constant what about the third parameter given in the question called the electric field well we already know that e is dv by dr isn't it where v represents the potential difference across the ends of the conductor now if the potential difference applied across the ends of the conductor is constant well in that case e will become delta v by delta r isn't it and clearly it will then be constant if this is constant and the length we are taking is definitely constant in that case the electric field will also be constant but we do not really know whether the potential difference is constant or not but if we assume that the potential difference is constant then the electric field is also constant understood so now let's finally take a look at our options let us see which of those options is now correct option a said current electric field and drift speed are constant this option is clearly wrong that's because current is constant electric field can be constant if the potential difference is constant but the drift speed is definitely not constant so this option is wrong second option says drift speed is constant but we know that a1 v1 is a2 v2 so the drift speed varies as the area of cross section varies option number 3 is also wrong because again drift speed is not constant option number 4 is the correct option because it says only the electric current is constant which is so true because we just saw that as in the case of water flow when mass flow rate is constant current the charge flow rate is also always constant irrespective of the area of cross section so that was a final answer so did you see you know one iit je problem tested all the concepts that we had studied up till now current drift speed and how current and drift speed vary as the area of cross section varies now that we have understood these concepts let's move on to the next concept the next thing we are going to study is ohm's law it has been found that for most metals the current density j is proportional to the electric field applied across the conductor This is interesting but scientists have found this fact so if there is this conductor which has an electric field E applied across its ends in that case the current per meter square flowing across this conductor will be proportional to the electric field the proportionality constant is generally termed sigma and so j is sigma E sigma is called the electric conductivity of the metal and this expression J is sigma e is called ohm's law of course you must remember this expression as it is fundamental to our study of electric current sigma the electrical conductivity basically refers to how much current will flow through a conductor when a certain electric field is applied across the ends of the conductor so the more the electrical conductivity the more current will flow when electric field e is applied isn't it for example if sigma is less then you can keep applying a very large electric field but the current density will still be less but if sigma is very high then even for a small value of electric field a very large current density will be produced this expression of ohm's law can be further simplified to another expression which is another form of ohm's law so as you can see j equal to sigma e can be replaced by the expression j equal to e by rho rho here is 1 by sigma and it is termed as resistivity so rho is a constant that is often used to replace sigma here now if j is e by rho in that case we can say that i by a is 1 by rho into v by l isn't it j the current density is basically i by a the current flowing per unit area of this green conductor isn't it 
The electric field on the other hand can be written as V by L. If L is the length of the conductor that we are taking into account, you know across which we are applying a potential difference V using a battery, then the electric field created inside the conductor will clearly be V divided by L, isn't it? Because E is dV by dr. This is equal to delta V by delta R if the potential difference across the conductor is constant. So when we make these replacements and when we replace sigma, the conductivity with 1 by rho, the resistivity, we get this expression. I by A is 1 by rho into V by L. On further simplification, we get V equal to rho L by A into I. The term rho L by A, where rho is the resistivity, L is the length of the conductor, you know, across which we are applying the potential difference and A is the area of cross-section of the conductor. This term rho L by A is called resistance and it is given a symbol capital R. So basically, rho L by A can be replaced by capital R and therefore, we can say that V equal to IR. V is the potential difference across the conductor, I is the current flowing across the conductor and R is the net resistance offered by the conductor to current flow. This formula V equal to IR is the popular form of Ohm's law. This is the formula that we'll keep using again and again and again in our study of electric current. So this is another form of Ohm's law. The first form of course is J equal to sigma E where sigma is the electrical conductivity. There is yet another term that is defined and that is related to R the resistance. Just as 1 by sigma is rho and 1 by rho is sigma, 1 by R is termed as conductance. So R is resistance, 1 by R is called conductance, sigma is electrical conductivity and rho is electric resistivity. Now there are so many terms, there is sigma, there is R, there is rho, there is conductance 1 by R. So it's very easy to get confused between all these terms. So let us look at each of these terms and see what it represents physically. First there is rho. Rho is the resistivity. It represents the resistance to the flow of electric current. This means that you know when a potential difference V is applied across a conductor, will the current flow or will the flow of current be resisted by the conductor? So the amount of resistance that the conductor will offer to the flow of electric current, that is what resistivity approximately represents. R is resistance. Now R also represents the approximate resistance to the flow of electric current that a conductor offers. So if we apply a potential difference V across a conductor, will the current flow properly? How much current will flow? R decides all these things because R decides how much resistance the conductor will offer. So what is the difference between rho and r? We already know that you know r is rho l by a. After all we replaced rho l by a by r when we derived Ohm's law. So the main difference here is that rho is the property of a substance. It is independent of the length of the substance or the area of cross section of the substance. Rho is the property of any material. For example, Iron has a certain value of rho. Glass has a certain value of rho. Gold has a certain value of rho. However, resistance is not independent of the physical properties of the substance. You know, resistance depends on the length of the conductor. It depends on the area of cross section of the conductor. So all bars of gold will have the same resistivity, but they will have a different resistance. If you take one meter of gold which has an area of say 0 0.05 meter square you know the area of cross section and if you take you know 2 meters of gold which say 0 0.025 meter square of cross sectional area in that case both these bars of gold will have the same resistivity because resistivity is a property of the material however both these bars of gold will have different resistance because resistance you know, also depends on the length of the material and the area of cross section across the material. Understood? A very similar difference occurs between sigma, the conductivity and 1 by R, which is also represented by the symbol G, conductance. 
conductivity is the property of the material so again iron has some conductivity glass has some conductivity and gold has some conductivity however conductance is different for the same substance depending on the length of the substance or the area of cross section of the substance understood so that is the difference between conductivity and conductance both these parameters however represent how much current the substance will allow to pass when a potential difference is applied across it so if a potential difference v is applied across a conductor the more the conductivity and conductance the more the current that will pass through the conductor understood so the higher the value of conductivity and the higher the value of conductance the more the electric current passing when we apply a potential difference v so that is the difference between all these terms ponder over what i have said carefully and you'll definitely understand i'll also tell you about the units of all these terms sigma the conductivity is measured in mho per meter mho as you can see is the reverse of ohm rho the resistivity is measured in ohm meters g the conductance is measured in mho and r the resistance is measured in ohms the most common of all these terms that we will use again and again is the term resistance but you must remember the units of all these terms just to get an idea of how resistivity values in general are like and you know how conductors have resistivity values and insulators have resistivity values we can look at the actual resistivity values of different substances at 20 degrees celsius gold has resistivity of approximately 2.44 into 10 raised to minus 8 ohm meters at 20 degrees celsius iron however is a lesser conductor of electricity compared to gold so it has a higher resistivity value because it offers higher resistance to the flow of electric current it has a resistivity of around 9.7 into 10 raised to minus 8 ohm meter if you take glass glass offers immense resistance to the flow of electric current in fact have you ever seen you know electric wires made of glass never because glass is an insulator so the resistivity of glass is 1014 ohm meter a very very bad conductor of electricity is water its resistivity value is 182000 ohm meters that is 182000 ohm meters salt water however conducts electricity much better than ordinary water this water that we are talking about is distilled water so these were some resistivity values to give you an idea of how the resistivity values for conductors and insulators are like and now that we've understood so much about all these concepts let's move on to the next concept let's try to find out the temperature dependence of resistivity because this is very important with respect to the iit je syllabus it has been found that resistivity increases with increase in temperature why does this happen and what is the formula for the increase in temperature that is like what is the exact expression for the increase in resistivity with increase in temperature before we understand the formula let's see why the resistivity actually increases with temperature you see when the temperature is low the free electrons inside the conductor move quite slowly therefore you know the collisions between the electrons are also less frequent because the electrons are moving slowly in a random way when the temperature is increased the free electrons move much faster and the collisions become much much more frequent so the collision time the time between two collisions keeps on decreasing as the temperature is increased when the temperature is increased even further in that case the free electrons interact very very fast there's hardly any time between two collisions because the collision time really really decreases now scientists have found out that vd the drift velocity is proportional to the collision time that is the drift velocity you know the velocity with which the electrons flow in a certain direction is proportional to the time between two collisions of the electrons now as we know when the temperature keeps on increasing the time between two collisions really decreases because the electrons keep colliding again and again and again because they're moving so fast 
and therefore when temperature increases drift velocity decreases now a drift velocity decrease simply means that less current will flow isn't it after all current is proportional to drift velocity and the fact that less current flows means that the resistivity increases after all resistivity refers to the obstruction in the flow of electric current so the greater the temperature the lesser the current and the higher the resistivity now i know this reason seems vague but for the iit j syllabus this understanding will be enough resistivity is actually given by this particular formula rho equal to rho not into 1 plus alpha into t minus t not here rho is the resistivity at a temperature t t is any random temperature t not refers to a standard temperature generally the standard temperature is taken as 20 degrees celsius rho not refers to the resistivity at 20 degrees celsius alpha is a constant for every substance and alpha is often called temperature coefficient of resistivity temperature coefficient of resistivity you must remember this expression and the one fact that you have to remember is that when temperature increases resistivity increases one fascinating fact here is that this happens only in case of metals and conductors the fact that resistivity increases with increase in temperature is not true for a special class of materials called semiconductors in case of semiconductors resistivity decreases with increase in temperature but they are the exception in general temperature increases means resistivity increases we will learn more about semiconductors in the chapters to come now let us try to study the combination of resistors so up till now we had studied about resistivity and resistance but we had not used resistivity or resistance in a circuit so let's study what happens when we actually connect resistors with a battery and create a circuit when we do that what happens is that a potential drop takes place you see the net potential across the battery is v right but the battery causes a current i to flow through the circuit and because of ohm's law we know that the potential difference across a resistor will be v equal to ir isn't it so across this resistor r1 a potential drop ir1 occurs and across the resistor r2 a potential drop ir2 occurs and these potential drops are such that ir1 plus ir2 is equal to v understood that is what happens when you connect a resistor to a battery another important fact that you must note is that when you connect a resistor to a battery the potential of the resistor nearer to the positive end of the battery will be higher so this will be at a higher potential and this end will be at a lower potential for this resistor this end will be at a higher potential and this end will be at a lower potential that's because as you know we move farther and farther away from the positive end of the battery the potential keeps on decreasing until it comes to the lowest point at the negative end of the battery understood now you might also be curious about what the word resistor really means a resistor is simply a conductor with a fixed value of resistance and this resistance is generally measurable for example we can have a 1 ohm resistor a 2 ohm resistor or even a 10 ohm resistor understood so all these resistors are basically made up of metals just that they have some measurable resistance values whenever we draw any circuit we generally assume that these connecting wires do not have any resistance in fact they have zero resistance this is of course not true and in practical situations you have to account for the resistance of these conducting wires too but in general we assume that the wires are only conductors without offering any resistance and r1 and r2 and r3 and so on are the resistors which we have attached to the circuit the first thing about resistors that we'll study is the series combination of resistors remember we studied the series combination of capacitors in that case we had said that when one capacitor is connected after the other capacitor after the other capacitor after the other capacitor with respect to the battery we have a series connection 
in this case too very similarly when one resistor is connected to the positive terminal of the battery and then another resistor is connected and then another resistor is connected and so on we have a series combination of resistors in case of a series combination of resistors we can find out the equivalent resistance so in this case you can see R1 and you can see R2 the equivalent resistance will be that resistance that can replace R1 and R2 so as you can see if a current I flows through this circuit in that case V equal to I into R equivalent isn't it because that R equivalent will replace both R1 and R2 how do we calculate the equivalent resistance we will apply Kirchhoff's law we have studied about Kirchhoff's voltage law isn't it if you remember Kirchhoff's voltage law states that the net algebraic directed sum of all potentials in a closed circuit loop is zero what that means is when you add up all the potential differences in a circuit in a particular direction clockwise or anti-clockwise the net sum is zero so let's apply Kirchhoff's law in this circuit in the clockwise direction the potential increase across the battery is clearly plus V isn't it if we are moving from right to left the potential of the battery is increasing from 0 to plus V now the potential drop across resistance R1 is minus IR1 the potential is decreasing because as I said earlier the left end of R1 is connected to the positive terminal of the battery and as you move away from the positive terminal the potential decreases actually the potential always decreases in the direction of the current and current always flows from higher potential to a lower potential so in this case for example you can assume that the current is flowing in this direction and therefore the potential is decreasing in this direction the potential drop across resistor R2 can be similarly calculated as you can see the potential difference across the resistor R2 is minus IR2 I have again written minus IR2 because we are moving in the direction of the flow of electric current and along the direction of flow of electric current the potential decreases isn't it now applying Kirchhoff's law we can say that plus V minus IR1 minus IR2 equal to 0 after all the net potential difference sum across the closed loop is 0 when we simplify this expression we get V by I is R1 plus R2 now we already know that V by I is R equivalent isn't it after all if we replace R1 and R2 by one resistor R equivalent then clearly V by I will be R equivalent therefore the net equivalent resistance in this case is simply R1 plus R2 the sum of the individual resistances in series in fact in any series connection of resistances the net equivalent resistor that can replace all the individual resistances will be equal to sigma ri that is it will be equal to the sum of all the individual resistances now this is a very important formula and you have to remember it that the net equivalence resistance in case of series connections is the sum of all the individual connections the current through all the resistances is the same in case of a series combination and this is obvious as you can see this one wire is leaving the positive end of the battery and it is passing through two resistances and coming back to the negative end of the battery as you can see the same current I is flowing through the battery through R1 and R2 so in series connections the current through all resistances is the same the potential drop across each resistor is proportional to R in case of series resistances and that is always true isn't it after all we know that V equal to IR so the potential drop across the first resistor is IR1 the potential drop across the second resistor is minus IR2 so clearly the potential drop is proportional to the resistance in case of series connections let's now have a look at a parallel combination of resistors a parallel combination of resistors simply means that each resistor is connected to both the positive and the negative end of the battery so as you can see this first resistor R1 is connected to the positive end and the negative end 
R2 is connected to the positive end and the negative end and even R3 is connected to the positive and negative ends of the battery. Again as you can see the potential difference across each of these resistors is the same. Isn't it? After all all the resistances are connected to the battery so the potential difference across each resistor must be the same as the potential difference across the battery. In this case too our aim is to calculate the equivalent resistance that can replace all these three parallel resistances by one single resistance R equivalent. Now in this case the current I from the battery this one will actually split up into three currents I1, I2 and I3 isn't it? So as you can see I1 current will flow through R1 resistor, I2 current will flow through R2 resistor and I3 current will flow through R3 resistor. The net sum of all these three currents will obviously be I, the net current coming from the battery. The equivalent resistance again will be V divided by I, isn't it? The net electric potential difference divided by the current flowing from the battery. If we apply Kirchhoff's law in all these three loops here, we get V minus I1 R1 equal to 0, V minus I2 R2 equal to 0 and V minus I3 R3 equal to 0. Isn't it? We have applied the Kirchhoff's law in the loops containing the battery and the first resistance, the battery and the second resistance and the battery and the third resistance. Now we already know that R equivalent is V divided by I isn't it? And I is I1 plus I2 plus I3, isn't it? Because the electric current coming from the battery is distributed into three branches. Now from these three equations which we have obtained from applying Kirchhoff's law, we get I1 as V by R1, we get I2 as V by R2 and I3 as V by R3. When we substitute I1, I2 and I3 by V by R1, V by R2 and V by R3 and when we substitute I by V by R equivalent, we get this expression. When we cancel V from all these expressions here, we get this expression. And this is the expression that you must remember when you think of calculating the equivalent resistance in case of parallel connections. 1 by R equivalent equal to 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2 plus 1 by R3. In fact, if there are n resistances you can simply say 1 by R equivalent is sigma 1 by Ri. So basically you will add the reciprocals of all the resistances which are in parallel and then you will obtain the reciprocal of the equivalent resistance of all those resistances. So this is the important formula you must remember. One fascinating fact which I had already told you a short while ago is that the potential difference across all resistors is the same in case of parallel connections. As you can see the potential difference across R1, R2 and R3 is V because all the resistors are connected to the battery. Another interesting fact is that the current across each resistor I1, I2, I3 is actually proportional to 1 by R. After all the current through this resistor R1 will clearly be V divided by R1, isn't it? Because the potential difference across this resistor is V and the resistance is R1. Similarly, the current through the resistor R2 will be V divided by R2. The current through the resistor R3 will be V divided by R3. And therefore, the current across each resistor will be proportional to 1 by R. So now we've studied a lot about resistances, resistivity and so many other concepts. Let's finally get down to solving an IITJ problem. That will definitely clear our head. Let's proceed. This problem was asked in IITJ 1997. From the picture of the problem itself you can make out that this is something simple and interesting. Find the equivalent resistance between the points A and B of the circuit given below. Ok, so we had calculated the equivalent resistance in case of a series circuit. We have done that in case of a parallel circuit. Here a weird looking circuit is given and we have to calculate the resistance between points A and B. How will we proceed? Let us look at each resistance carefully. Let's look at this first resistance 2R. 
one end of this resistance is connected to point A and the other end is connected to point B, isn't it? So we've done just that. We've replaced that 2R resistance by this resistance which is connected to point A and point B. Now let's look at the second resistance. The resistance 2R, this one. Again, one end of it is connected to point A. You can see that here, right? And the other end is connected to point B. Oh, so we can replace the 2R resistance by this resistance. If you look at the third R resistance, you will see that again, one end of the third resistance is connected to point A, this one. And another end is connected to point B. And therefore, when you look carefully, you will see that all these three resistances are connected to point A and point B. So all of them are in parallel because the definition of a parallel connection is that all the resistances in a parallel connection must be connected to the same two points A and B, isn't it? The potential difference across all the resistors must be the same. Therefore we can say that 1 by R equivalent is 1 by 2R plus 1 by 2R plus 1 by R. And when we simplify this expression, we get the final value of R equivalent as R by 2. So that is the answer to this simple IITJ problem. As you can see, this IITJ problem simply twisted the concept of parallel resistances to test your concepts about parallel resistances. Here's another IITJ problem. This IITJ problem related to series and parallel connections was asked in IITJ 1980. Find the effective resistance between the points A and B. Okay, this figure looks daunting. There's this point A and there's this point B. We have to calculate the equivalent resistance that can replace all these different resistances shown in the figure. How will we proceed? Well, this question appears complicated but it is actually quite simple. If you look at this figure carefully, you'll see that these two 3 ohm resistors here are in series. So we can clearly add those series resistances and replace them with a single 6 ohm resistance, isn't it? Because 3 plus 3 is 6. Now these two 6 ohm resistances, these two here, are in parallel. So you can replace these two 6 ohm resistances with one single resistance using the formula for parallel connections, isn't it? Now we know that 6 into 6 divided by 6 plus 6 will be the value of this equivalent resistance, isn't it? Because when you say that 1 by R equivalent is 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2, then R equivalent is R1 R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So in this case, the equivalent resistance comes out to be 3 ohms. Now 3 ohms and 3 ohms are again in series, so they can be added up and replaced by a 6 ohm resistance. In this case again, you can see that 6 ohm and 6 ohm are again in parallel and they can be replaced by a 3 ohm resistance. 3 ohm and 3 ohm are again in series and they can be replaced by a 6 ohm resistance. And these two 6 ohm resistances are again in parallel and they can be replaced by a 3 ohm resistance. Now again, you can see that we have this 3 ohm resistance in parallel with these two resistances which are both in series, isn't it? So when we simplify them, we get the final equivalent resistance across the circuit as 2 ohms. And that is our final answer. So this IITJ problem simply involved adding up resistances when resistance were in series and then adding up the reciprocals of resistances when the resistances were in parallel. That's it. Let's now move on to the next important concept in this chapter, the Kirchhoff's Junction Rule. Kirchhoff's Junction Rule states that the algebraic sum of the currents into any junction is zero. Sigma i is zero. Now what does this rule mean and how is this rule useful? Actually the language of this rule is quite difficult but the rule itself is quite simple. All that this rule states is that when two currents intersect at a junction, then the third current I3 will be the sum of the first two currents I1 and I2. So you can say 
that i1 plus i2 minus i3 is 0. The algebraic sum of all the three currents at a junction is 0. Or i1 plus i2 is i3. That is actually pretty obvious, isn't it? And that's what Kirchhoff's junction rule is all about. If there are four currents here, like this, and if this is i1, this is i2, this is i3, and this is i4, in that case, you can say that the net incoming currents will be equal to the net outgoing currents. So i1 plus i2 will be equal to i3 plus i4, isn't it? Kirchhoff's junction rule simply says this, that the net currents coming into a junction are the same as the net currents going out of the junction. We have already made use of this Kirchhoff's rule when we derived the formulae for the equivalent resistance in parallel connections. After all, remember we took this battery and we said, you know, that a current I was flowing through the battery and then we said that there was this resistance connected to the battery, there was this resistance and there was this other resistance. Now we split up this current I into I1, I2 and I3, remember? Now clearly we said that I1 plus I2 plus I3 was equal to I, isn't it? And when we said that, we basically used Kirchhoff's junction rule, isn't it? Because we said at this junction, the current I had split up into I1, I2 and I3. Even though Kirchhoff's junction rule is quite basic, you can also derive it using basic charge conservation. If a charge Q is flowing from here and Q from here, then clearly the charge flowing here out of the junction will be 2Q, Q plus Q, isn't it? Similarly, if a charge Q1 is coming from one end and if charge Q2 is coming from another end into the junction, then the net charge flowing out of the junction Q3 will clearly be equal to Q1 plus Q2, isn't it? Now we can differentiate this equation and say dq1 by dt equal to dq2 by dt plus dq3 by dt, isn't it? And therefore, we can say that i1 plus i2 is equal to i3 at every single junction. And that is all about Kirchhoff's current rule. So let's solve some more IITJ problems related to Kirchhoff's current rule series and parallel resistor combination. Let's proceed. This problem was asked in IITJ 1998. In the circuit, the current through the 3 ohm resistor is 0.5 amperes. The 3 ohm resistor is 0.25 amperes. The 4 ohm resistor is 0.5 amperes. The 4 ohm resistor is 0.25 amperes. So basically, we are given this slightly complicated circuit we have to calculate the current through the 3 ohm resistor, this one here, and the 4 ohm resistor, this one here. And then we have to see which of these options is correct, isn't it? So let's start off and find the current through each resistor. Now to find the current through the 3 ohm resistor, we will first have to calculate the equivalent resistor of this circuit. You see, if we calculate the equivalent resistance of the circuit, then we can say that this is a 9 volt battery and this is R equivalent, isn't it? And the current that is coming out of the battery will then be equal to I that is 9 divided by R equivalent, isn't it? And this is the current that will flow through the 3 ohm resistor because the 3 ohm resistor is directly connected to the positive terminal of the battery. So the first step is to calculate R equivalent to get the current through the 3 ohm resistor. So first of all, let us calculate the equivalent resistance. As you can clearly see, this 2 ohm resistance, 4 ohm resistance and 2 ohm resistance are in series. So they can be replaced by resistance which is equal to the sum of 2, 4 and 2, that is 8 ohms. Now this 8 ohm resistance and this 8 ohm resistance are in parallel. So they can be replaced by resistance which has a value 8 into 8 divided by 8 plus 8, R1, R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So we get a 4 ohm resistance here. Now this 2 ohm resistance, this 4 ohm resistance and this 2 ohm resistance are again in series. So we can add up all these 3 resistances. 
Now, once we add up all these three resistances, we can actually see that this 8 ohm resistance here and the sum of all these three series resistances are in parallel, isn't it? So this 8 ohm resistance and the equivalent of all these three resistances, both of these resistances will clearly be in parallel. The sum of these three resistances comes out to be 8 ohms. So this 8 ohm resistance and this 8 ohm resistance are in parallel. When we simplify, we get a final resistance of 4 ohms. Again, this 3 ohm resistance, this 4 ohm resistance and this 2 ohm resistance are in parallel. So when we add up these resistances, we finally get the net value of the equivalent resistance of this circuit as 9 ohms. Now we know that 9 volts is the battery connected across this equivalent resistance. So the net current flowing through this circuit will be 1 ampere because I is V by R. That is 9 divided by 9 equal to 1. Now we know that a current 1 ampere is flowing like this through the 3 ohm resistance, isn't it? So we have calculated the current flowing through the 3 ohm resistance. The next step is to calculate the current flowing through the 4 ohm resistance, this one here. To do so, we will have to apply Kirchhoff's junction rule. You see, if a current of 1 ampere is coming like this, in that case, we can assume that a current I1 passes through this 8 ohm resistor here, isn't it? Now if a current I1 passes through this 8 ohm resistor but a current 1 ampere was coming inside the junction then by Kirchhoff's junction rule a current 1 minus I1 will pass through this 2 ohm resistor here, isn't it? Because the current of 1 ampere will split up into two currents, I1 and 1 minus I1. Similarly, this current which has a magnitude 1 minus I1 will again split up into two currents, I2 and 1 minus I1 minus I2, isn't it? So the current I2 will flow through this resistor and the current 1 minus I1 minus I2 will flow through this 2 ohm resistor. Now we can apply Kirchhoff's voltage law across loop 1, this loop here and loop 2. This second loop here consisting of the battery and all these second loop resistors to get the value of I1 and I2. Applying Kirchhoff's voltage law, we can say that plus 9 here, minus 1 into 3 here, minus I1 into 8 here, minus 2 into 1 is 0 because Kirchhoff's voltage law states that the algebraic sum of all the potential drops in a loop is 0. As you can see, plus 9 is the potential gain here, minus I into 3 that is minus 1 into 3 is the potential drop here. Similarly, minus I1 into 8 is the potential drop here and minus 2 into 1 is the potential drop here. Isn't it? We can similarly apply Kirchhoff's law in the second loop consisting of the battery, this 3 ohm resistance, this 2 ohm resistance, 8 ohm resistance and these two 2 ohm resistances. When we do that, we get this expression as you can see, plus 9 minus 1 into 3 minus 1 minus I1 into 2 minus I2 into 8 minus 1 minus I1 into 2 minus 2 into 1 is 0, isn't it? Now this might seem a bit complicated but basically I have simply applied Kirchhoff's voltage law in this loop, this loop here. Clearly, the potential drop across this resistor will be half into 2 because I1 is already half ampere. So 1 minus I1 will be half, isn't it? So half into 2 will be the potential drop here. The potential drop here will also be half into 2 because by symmetry, this current will also be 1 minus I1, isn't it? And this current will be I, that is 1 ampere. So just think about what's happening and what's the potential drop across each resistor and you'll get it. When we write these two equations, we automatically get the value of I1 as half ampere and I2 as 1 by 4 ampere. And that gives us our answer because we have to calculate the value of the current through the 4 ohm resistor. The current through the 4 ohm resistor is 1 minus I1 
minus I2. I2 is 1 by 4 ampere. I1 is half ampere. So the current through the 4 ohm resistor is 1 minus 3 by 4 amperes. That is 1 by 4 amperes, isn't it? So the answer is that the current through the 4 ohm resistors is 0.25 amperes and the current through the 3 ohm resistor is 1 ampere. Now let us look at each option and see which of the options is correct. So here, these were the options we were given. The current through the 3 ohm resistor is 1 ampere. So option A is wrong and option B is also wrong. The current through the 4 ohm resistor is 0.25 amperes. So option C is wrong and option D is correct. So there we have solved this IITJ problem and got our answer. As you can see, all that this IITJ problem involved was the concept of the Kirchhoff's junction rule and the concept of solving series and parallel resistances. That's all. Here's yet another IITJ problem. Let's try to solve it. In the given circuit with steady current, find the potential difference across the capacitor circuit. So in this question, we are given this circuit which consists of two resistors and one capacitor. We have to calculate the potential difference across the capacitor circuit. That is, we have to calculate the potential difference between these two points A and B because this constitutes the capacitor circuit, isn't it? So how will we do it? Now if you observe carefully, current will only flow through the resistors. It will not flow through the capacitor circuit, isn't it? You see, we have already learned that the capacitor stores charge. It will have a charge plus Q here. It will have a charge minus Q here. Now, how will this charge be transferred from this point to this point, isn't it? Because current is basically the flow of charge. It's the amount of charge flowing per second. Now, there's no charge flowing from here to here per second. So clearly, there will be no current traveling through this circuit, isn't it? And therefore, current will exist here and here. Now if that is so, we can actually replace this circuit by having only a single current, I instead of I1 and I2, isn't it? After all, this current will flow in this loop like this, like this and the capacitor will block the flow of electric current here. Now what will the value of this current I be? We can apply Kirchhoff's voltage law in this loop. When we do that, we can see that plus 2V minus I into 2R minus I into R minus V is equal to 0, isn't it? As you can see, the potential drop across this 2R resistor will be I into 2R and the potential drop across this R resistor will be I into R. Now when we simplify this expression, we get the value of this current flowing through these two wires here as I equal to V by 3R. Now we have finally found out the value of the current flowing through this circuit. But how will we find out the net potential drop across the capacitor circuit? Well, clearly all these three circuits, the circuit of this resistor R, the circuit of the capacitor and the circuit of the resistor 2R. All of them have the same potential difference between them, isn't it? After all, all of them have the same point A at one end and the same point B at the other end. Therefore, we can say that the potential drop across this particular circuit here will be the same as the potential drop across the capacitor circuit. So the potential drop across the third circuit shown will be plus 2V minus I into 2R, isn't it? And I is V by 3R. When we substitute plus 2V minus I into 2R with the correct value of I, that is V by 3R, we get the final potential drop across the capacitor circuit as 4V by 3. And so our answer is 4V by 3. This will be the potential drop across the capacitor circuit. Again, all this question involved was the core concept of applying Kirchhoff's laws and of potential difference being the same across all these three circuits. Now it's time for yet another IITJ problem. This question was asked in IITJ 1981. In the circuit shown below, E1 is 3 volts, E2 is 2 volts, E3 is 1 volt and R is R1, R2, R3, 
equal to 1 ohm. So in this circuit shown below, E1 is given, E2 is given, E3 is given and the value of all the resistances is given. We have to find out the potential difference between the points A and B and the currents through each branch and then if R2 is short circuited and the point A is connected to point B we have to find the currents through E1, E2, E3 and the resistor R. Clearly this question seems to be a bit hi-fi with a lot of concepts involved but once we get into the depth of this question and start solving it I am sure you will find it to be very simple. Let's start with part A first. We have to find the potential difference between the points A and B and then we have to find the current through each branch of this circuit. Now to calculate the potential difference between the points A and B and the current through each branch of the circuit we need to apply Kirchhoff's laws. So let's apply it. Let's assume that a current I is flowing from the end A. Let's assume that the current in the first branch is I1, the current in the second branch is I2 and the current in the third branch is I minus I1 minus I2. We have used Kirchhoff's junction rules to divide these currents because clearly this is I1, this is I2 and so the current in the third branch must be I minus I1 I2 by Kirchhoff's junction rule. Now if we apply Kirchhoff's voltage law in this first loop here this one we will get minus I1 into 1 minus 3 plus 2 plus I2 into 1 equal to 0. Note that as I have calculated the potential drops across each element of the circuit I have taken you know the potential drop in the direction of the current to be negative. So you, you can see that you know I have written minus I1 into 1 because the current is flowing towards the right and I am applying Kirchhoff's voltage law towards the right in this case. Similarly I have written minus 3 because the potential of the battery is decreasing. Similarly in this case the potential of the battery is increasing plus 2. Similarly the potential difference across the resistor is increasing because we are going against the direction of the current and the potential decreases in the direction of the current. So against the direction of the current the potential will increase. So I have written plus I2 into 1 is equal to 0. Similarly, let's apply Kirchhoff's law for the second loop, this loop here, this one you see. When we do that we get this equation. From the first equation simplification tells us that I2 equal to I1 plus 1. When we substitute I2 in the second equation as I1 plus 1 we get this expression. We get the value of I1 as I by 3 minus 1. We get the value of I2 the current to the second branch as I by 3 and we get the value of I3 the current through the third branch which is simply I minus I1 minus I2 as I by 3 plus 1. So basically simply applying Kirchhoff's laws gives us the values of I1, I2 and I3 in terms of I the current that is coming from the point A and which is flowing through the 1 ohm resistor. Our next step is to calculate the potential difference between VA and VB. We also want to calculate the actual value of these three currents because currently we have clearly obtained these values in terms of I but we don't know I either. So we have to calculate I too. Now we will apply a special form of Kirchhoff's law to arrive at the value of I and the potential difference between VA and VB. You see whenever you are given two points A and B and whenever you know you are given a lot of circuit elements which have potential drops PD1, PD2 and PD3 in that case you can always remember that VA minus PD1 minus PD2 minus PD3 equal to VB if a current is flowing from A to B. As you can see this is a modified form of Kirchhoff's law. After all you can replace these two points A and B by one single element you know in the circuit which has a potential difference VA minus VB. So in that case you know you would say VA minus VB minus PD1 minus PD2 minus PD3 is 0. So when you modify Kirchhoff's law you can apply this equation. 
Similarly, if you have this point A and if you have this point B, and again, if you have PD1, the potential drop across the first element, PD2 and PD3, and if your current is actually flowing like this from B to A, in that case, you can write VA plus PD1 plus PD2 plus PD3 equal to VB. So in this case, this would be our expression of the modified Kirchhoff's law. We can apply the modified Kirchhoff's law here too. We can say that VA minus I into 1 minus I by 3 minus 1 into 1 here in the resistor on the top minus 3 equal to VB, isn't it? We have basically considered this single line, this one here and applied the modified Kirchhoff's law. We can similarly apply the modified Kirchhoff's law here along this line. When we do that, we get VA minus I into 1 minus I by 3 into 1 minus 2 equal to VB, isn't it? Now we have two equations and in both these equations we have two variables. The first variable is VA minus VB, the potential difference between points A and B and the second variable is I, the current that is flowing from point A. When we simplify this equation, we get VA minus VB equal to 2 volts and we get the value of I as 0 amperes. When we get the value of I as 0 amperes, substituting the values of I in I by 3 minus 1, I by 3 and I by 3 plus 1, we get the values of I1, I2 and I3 as minus 1 amperes, 0 amperes and 1 ampere respectively. Understood? So we have calculated the values of currents in each branch of this circuit and we have calculated the potential difference between points A and B which is 2 volts. We will use this modified form of the Kirchhoff's law that we just applied in those cases when we are explicitly asked about the potential difference between two particular points or you know when we are specified the potential difference of two particular points. We can then apply this modified form of Kirchhoff's law between those two points. If you remember, our question also had a second part. So let's have a look at the second part of the question. The second part of the question said that the resistor in the middle here had been removed. So basically, this resistor was removed and the wire was joined like this. It also said that points A and B were connected together like this. We now have to find out the values of the currents I1, I2 and I3 that is the current through each branch of the circuit. In this case, we can find that out by applying Kirchhoff's voltage law. You see, we can apply Kirchhoff's law in this direction like this. This could be loop 1, this could be loop 2 and here this could be loop 3, isn't it? So let's start applying Kirchhoff's voltage law. When we apply Kirchhoff's law in the first loop, we have minus i into 1 minus i1 into 1 minus 3 equal to 0. When we apply Kirchhoff's law in the second loop, you know, in the second loop consisting of this resistor of 1 ohm and this battery of voltage 2 volts, we have minus i into 1 minus 2 equal to 0. In the third loop, we have minus i into 1 minus 1 minus i1 minus i2 into 1 minus 1 equal to 0. Note that in all these three cases, we have assumed, you know, that the direction of the current is also the direction of decreasing potential difference. Remember, whenever we have had to calculate the potential difference, you know, across a resistor in the direction in which the current is flowing, then we have considered a negative potential drop. For example, the potential drop through this resistance has been considered to be minus i into 1. Understood? So when we simplify all these equations, we get I1 equal to minus 1 amperes, I2 equal to minus 2 amperes and I3 equal to plus 1 amperes. I, the current coming from point A here is minus 2 amperes. So these are the values of the currents when point A and point B are connected together and when the resistor in the middle branch here is removed. And this is our final answer. So what this problem involved was the concept of Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's junction law. That's it. So that brings us to the end of this chapter related to electric current. Let's move on to the next chapter related to electric current.